So let's get started. Today I'll be talking about um, efficient acquisition for diffusion imaging. Uh, you want to turn the light on? So um, before I get to that, I'll just give you a kind of an overview of the research interest that I've been working on in the MRI field. So I started off working a lot on a parallel transmit project for my PhD, and then I moved on into um, parallel receive and image reconstruction as well. And today my talk will be focused on the later part here, specifically in looking at parallel imaging and um, um, image reconstruction methods to be able to speed up diffusion imaging. So here's the presentation outline. I'm going to be talking about a couple of things. Um, first is the simultaneous multi-slice acquisition and um, this method of parallel imaging to speed things up for diffusion imaging and fMRI by a factor of three. And then um, we'll talk about compressed sensing specifically for diffusion spectrum imaging, trying to use it to speed things up by another factor of four. And then finally, the last part will be in combining these two methods with um, acquiring data on the connectome system with the 64 channel array coil to um, get to about four minutes acquisition for diffusion spectrum imaging. So. The first part is going to be simultaneous multi-slice acquisition. I'm going to talk about the motivation, some of the techniques that I have developed in terms of acquisition as well as reconstruction, and show you some results. So the motivation in doing simultaneous multi-slice um, imaging for diffusion is that for most diffusion imaging, the TR is much longer than T1. So it's very inefficient in terms of SNR per unit time because everything is kind of fully relaxed by the time you um, acquire the new data set. So we know that standard parallel imaging doesn't really help us in reducing TR significantly for diffusion imaging because um, standard parallel imaging will shorten the um, readout period for the EPI, but it does not shorten the diffusion encoding period, which can take up a significant portion of the whole um, acquisition. So what we propose is to do a simultaneous multi-slice acquisition, or SMS. Uh, with this method, we excite and acquire multiple slices during each readout period. So with this, for example, in this example here, you're going to accelerate the acquisition just by a factor of three because you're acquiring three slices at once. This has the benefit over standard parallel imaging in that it does not um, incur square root of R or square root of acceleration factor um, SNR penalty because um, we, don't sh we do not shorten the readout period. We're just trying to acquire more data with the same amount of um, readout acquisition period. So of course I'm not the first one to try to um, do this. There's been multiple methods that people have proposed over the years to try to do this. Some of them are listed here, such as the Y-band method, member, and um, SIR. But um, these methods tends to have quite a bit of artifact with them particularly if you want to do um, more than two simultaneous multi-slice together. Um, so these are the three methods that have been proposed. The final method that has been proposed is the parallel imaging based method for simultaneous multi-slice. And I'll talk a little bit more about this and how I've um, modified this a bit to um, improve it. So with parallel imaging, you essentially just excite multiple slices. They look collapsed like this. And you're going to use parallel imaging to tease them apart. The problem is that the field view along the C direction is typically quite small compared to the in-plane field view. So the slices that are collapsed on top of each other are not that far apart. So you, when the, you're trying to pull them out, um, you're going to incur a high G factor penalty. There has been method that people have proposed to um, improve this by what they call Kuipernia or control aliasing in parallel imaging by um, using special RF excitation to induce a field view shift between the aliasing slice. So now the um, voxels that are overlapping are much further apart in space, therefore you won't incur as much of a G factor penalty. However, with this method, um, the way that they propose is to have multiple RF excitation, each one for each um, K space line. So this is not really applicable for EPI where for one group of um, simultaneous multi-slice, we only have one RF excitation. So there's also other methods that people have proposed in trying to do this for EPI using the wide band light shifting, but um, in combination with parallel imaging. 
But um, this also has a cause of significant um, artifacts in terms of um, voxel blurring. So what do I propose? I propose to um, try to improve the parallel imaging method to um, have the blip um, Kuiperina effect um, for EPI, but without the voxel blurring problem. Um, so that would be kind of the acquisition part. And I also propose um, a slice grapper algorithm, which is an algorithm to reconstruct these um, collapsed images. And last but not least, we also um, want to control the um, SAR specific absorption rate. So if you want to excite multiple slices at once, the RF energy deposited is going to be higher. So we have to kind of design the RF pulse in a nice way so that they still give good excitation without having too much of um, a SAR penalty. So I won't have too much time to talk about this, but I will focus on these two first topics for this part of the um, presentation. So let's look at the blip Kuiperina sequence and how um, we can use it to shift the um, simultaneously multi-slice acquisition. I'm going to compare it with the Y-band method, which was um, previously used, to show um, how we do a half a field view shift between this SMS slices and how this has a lot of artifact and this doesn't. So let's imagine you're trying to excite two slices here. And this is the Y-band method, how they do it, um, is to turn on some extra GC gradient during the readout period of the EPI. This GC gradient kind of mimics the phase encoding blips during the EPI readout. And as you read out along the, um, the K space, we're going to track the um, phase evolution of the center slice and the top slice, where each of these blips is going to cause a pi, pi phase change for the top slice and no phase change on the um, center slice. So as you step through, you can see that the top slice phase um, evolve a 0 pi, 0 pi, 0 pi, and this bottom <coughs> slice at the center does not have a phase of coral. So you see that there's a linear phase change across KY for the top slice, no phase change for the center slice. Therefore, you're going to get a half a field view shift on the top slice compared to the middle slice, causing them to alias in a half field view shift pattern. Um, this is all good, but um, one of the issues is that these slices are not infinitely thin. They have some thickness to them. So instead of getting a pi phase and a zero phase, you're going to get pi plus or minus delta and zero plus or minus delta. And we're going to track this and see how this causes this um, artifact in the Y-band method. So here's the phase evolution at the edge due to this large um, dephasing, um, pre-phasing um, lobe. You're going to get a large through plane dephasing for this slice. And as you step through these blips, you're going to get this kind of the phasing pattern throughout the slice. Let's see how this affects us and when we're trying to acquire the data. So at the start, you're going to get a large negative phase roll across the slice, looking like this. And as you evolve along KY as you're reading out, at the center there's no phase variation. At the other edge, there's um, a positive strong phase variation through the slice. So this is kind of the phase of the um, signal through the slice as you um, acquire the data. If we integrate this up, along the slice direction, we'll see how much um, signal cancellation or intrabox um, intraboxal dephasing we get along the C direction. So at the start, we're going to get a lot. At the center, not much, or none at all. And then at the edge, a lot in the other direction. So we're going to get some kind of filtering effect due to this um, phase um, through, through slice phase dephasing. So let's look in the um, impulse response domain now. If you take a Fourier transform along KY in this direction, then you kind of get the delta response. So at the center, there's no phase row. It's just linear. I mean, it's just um, a constant, so you're just going to get a delta. At the top, there's a linear phase row, and bottom, there's a, another linear phase row in the opposite direction. So you're just going to get a, del a shifted delta that's going to cause a kind of a voxel tilting effect. And if you integrate this up along the slice direction, you can see that you have this kind of um, blurring kernel, if you will, in your impulse response. So for typical imaging where the slices are about four centimeter apart, the voxel blurring artifact that you get with this um, Y-band approach in shifting the slice is around three or four voxel wide, which is really significant and can cause a lot of artifact in the image. So people don't really use this method much. Um, we're going to see how we can modify the sequence to um, get the same field view shift but without the artifact that we see here. 
And this is the sequence that we've modified. So what we've essentially done is to, remo to um, reverse the sign of these blips and replace this large um, prefacing blip with this small balancing blip. Let's see how this can um, create the right field view shift, but without causing significant artifact. So at the start, where you have this small balancing blip, the top slice will have a phase of negative pi over 2. And as you step through again, you get this pi phase and then negative pi, pi which bounces you back and forth with the top slice as such here. So that you still get the right phase evolution um, on the top slice and no phase on the center slice, giving you the right um, half a field view shift between the slices. Now let's look at um, possible artifacts. So now that we, the slides are not infinitely thin, with the balancing blip at the start, the um, phase variation across the slice is negative delta over 2. And as you step through, it's going to bounce back and forth instead of pan out like this in a small two states bounce between the um, zero phase state. The balancing blip is used to basically make sure it's balanced between the center state. So you're not going to get much of the um, phase error here. So let's look through into the Fourier space and see how this affects things. So here, you're just bouncing between two small phase states. So there's a small linear phase of opposite polarity each time you collect the ky line. And if you integrate that up along the c direction, you see that there's a very slight attenuation, typically less than 1%. And um, you just get a flat profile here with a less than 1% signal loss. So if you take this into the um, image domain and look at the impulse response, take a Fourier transform along the ky direction, you get a very strong center delta response with more than 99% of the signal. And I'm not sure whether it's showing up here, but you're getting a very small ghost artifact at the edge here, which if you integrate up along the c direction, they cancel because the positive and the negative c ghost has an um, opposite polarity. So you just integrate this out and it's gone. And you basically get essentially um, the delta response that you want um, as predicted by the attenuation um, picture here as well. So of course you can um, modify this to create whatever field of view shift that you want. The main um, trick in doing these sequences is that instead of incurring phase and keeping them evolved in the same clockwise direction, we kind of bounce it back and forth. The cool thing about phase is that um, they wrap around to, to 2 pi, and then so you can just bounce back and forth instead of keep occurring. So that's how um, you can do all these different field view shifts without um, incurring much artifact. So that's how um, we do the field view shift. Now I'm going to talk about the reconstruction. So a lot of people like to do. Um, Parallel imaging reconstruction in K space or grappa. Um, so, we want to come up with a method to do um, the parallel imaging reconstruction for this um, blip chi p acquisition. There has been an algorithm that was proposed a few years back called Sense Grappa Hybrid Algorithm. We're going to show you this method and then we're going to tell you why it doesn't quite work for our acquisition. I'm going to tell you about the method that I've developed to try to overcome issue with this and show you some um, of the results from that. So first, let's look at the sense grappa hybrid method that um, people have proposed before. So let's imagine you're trying to excite two slices and apply them simultaneously. Now let's say that um, we're going to look at a relationship where we're just going to concatenate these slices, as shown here in the, seed, um, in the y direction. Take a Fourier transform of that, you get some k-space lines. Remove every other case baseline, you get a collapse image. This is just a relationship picture. Um, the sense grappa hybrid method uses this um, relationship in the opposite way, where we have collapsed images, and we pretend that this collapsed image is, is the under sample case space data of this picture, and then we try to fill in these missing case space lines to get this image here, which we can chop and create the two images that we want. So the way that they do this is essentially fit grappa kernels so that they're going to try to find a missing line from the data surrounding it 
using the kernel weight n here. So the essentially collapse a C direction problem into this Y plane, and they can use the um, wrapper kernel to do this um, fitting. This is all good for the standard um, standard um, simultaneous multi-slice acquisition without the shift. Now let's look at the shift case and see how it can cost artifact using this method. So here we can catenate the image as such. With the blip KaiP, you shift the top slice so the concatenation appears slightly different, so it's going to look like this. With a grappa-based method, what you're trying to do is to fit a linear phase evolution along this um, y direction to be to essentially skip from the data point that you have and shift it in um, case space to the data point that you want. So let's look at this linear phase shift that you want to fit using the core sensitivity profile and the grappa kernel and see if we can do this properly. So let's look at the two images. The face, the desired phase that we want to be able to create with the grappa kernel and the core sensitivity profile is shown here. When the center slice is pretty linear phase. The top slice is also linear, but there's a discontinuity here. And this is a sharp discontinuity that can't really be fit with grappa kernel or core sensitivity. So we're going to get some artifact in our image when we're trying to reconstruct with this sense grappa hybrid method. Um, and we're going to show you here. So this is the standard um, acquisition without the blip kaipi. You can use the sense grappa with a 3x3 kernel to pull out the two slices. With the blip kaipi acquisition, you get these two slice image pulled out with the sense grappa, but you get this discontinuity line as we predicted earlier due to the phase discontinuity that we want to create to be able to pull the slice apart. And if you use a higher, um, a larger grappa kernel, you can fit a little bit better. For example, if you use 11 by 5, where 11 is along the y direction, you can see that, um, I'll flick back and forth, you can see that this discontinuity kind of goes down a bit, but it doesn't disappear because there's no way you can fit that sharp discontinuity with um, a limited grappa kernel size. So that's the main issue with the sense grappa algorithm. It doesn't work with the blip KaiP acquisition, so we came up with a different method <coughs> to try to fix this. The method that we came up with is pretty simple. So um, here's the collapsed data. Instead of forming some hybrid um, K space, we're just going to do a simple Fourier transform of this to get um, to the K space. And we're going <coughs> to find a grappa kernel, one set of grappa kernel to basically pull one set of um, slice apart, and a different kernel to pull the other image apart. So instead of having one grappa kernel set, we're going to have two grappa kernel set for the two simultaneous multi slice acquisition, and three if you have three slice, etc. So essentially, this is the fitting equation. You're trying to get signal for this slice from the collapse slice using weights apply one one weight per slice, one set of weight per um, slice that you want to pull apart. So this was um, easy to develop, but the hard part is to prove that it actually works for. Um, all the cases that we want with different image contrasts and things like that and see how that affects things. So for that we have to do a little bit of math and to prove that it actually works. So here's the fitting equation. If you expand this out for signal, this is basically this is the signal part and then this part here is the signal of the collapse data. So you just expand it out in this Fourier integral and do some cancellation of the terms you arrive at this governing equation. So what is the governing equation? The governing equation is kind of the equation that um, is your underlying model of the um, of grappa or slice grappa in this case. For normal grappa or smash, the governing equation will be that you're trying to use the grappa um, you're trying to use the grappa kernel and the cause sensitivity to create a linear phase across um, the image so that you can fill in the missing line. In this governing equation for slice grappa, you have core sensitivity profile and grappa kernel as well. But the problem with this equation is that you also have this image dependent or row, which is the spin density and contrast, in this governing equation, which is troublesome. The reason why it's troublesome is that if you have a fitting kernel, 
that you get from a set of data with a certain contrast. You're going to get some kernel here. And you're going to apply it for a diffusion-weighted image that have a different contrast. Then it might not fit that well, this equation. So what we need to prove, actually, is that it should not depend on the image contrast term. Unfortunately, I don't have time um, to do that here, but you can read it, um, read it up in the paper that we, um, that we have on the slice proper stuff. And I've proved that essentially for most brain imaging, this row term cancels out, and you just get a governing equation that has um, core sensitivity and grappa kernels, which is what we want, and um, it actually works. So here's an example where we have a collapsed image, we pull it out using two kernel, one kernel for this slice, and another kernel for the other slice. And we're getting the right images that we want. And now let's look at how much leakage from one slice is um, going into the other. So instead of applying the grappa kernel to grappa kernel set to the collapsed data, if we just apply it to each of the individual slice, and if you apply it to this, trying to pull out this slice from this image, there should be no contribution from this image going into this slice. So it's like a blocking filter, if you will. So with the first grappa kernel set applied to this, it just blocks it. It doesn't get into this image. And the second grappa kernel applied to this, you get essentially the same image out here. That's what you want. And um, exactly the same procedure here. So it was able, the grappa kernel was able to block out the signal and generate the right, and let through the right image to get the desired result that you want. So, um, so that's kind of the slice grappa method. Talk quickly a little bit about EPI. So when you're trying to apply everything to EPI, you have um, artifacts and things such as ghosts, which can affect your performance of the grappa kernel. For example, here if you apply a blip kyp kyp um, acquisition here, the ghost from the top slice will land on top of the center slice here in the image. And when you're pulling out the images, if you're able to only pull out the, um, the alias image but not the ghost, then the ghost will collapse on top of the image, causing significant artifact because the signal intensity for this slice is really high, while in this middle part is not that high. So even if you have a 3 or 4% ghost that you can't get rid of for the top slice that lands on top of the middle slice, it's going to cause you a lot of artifact in this region in the middle here. So the problem is the inter-slice goes, and um, we came up with a way to fix this to try to improve the reconstruction. So the issue is slice grappa fails to simultaneously unalias both the slice that we don't want and its ghost. And this is a problem with the um, kind of ghost being different for different slices. So what's happening here is that you know in in EPI acquisition, you have um, n over two goals where the case baseline are not aligned, and these goals are slice dependent due to local few variations. However, we can try to correct for these goals, but in the collapsed image, we only have one set of data. Let's say you acquire data from two slices; they require different alignment of the kx k um, of these kx lines, but you can only correct for one of them. So you can only correct for like an average ghost. So the data that you have before you apply the grappa kernel is kind of all jacket like this. It can't be straightened out properly. So if you look at how you apply the grappa kernel to the even and the odd line, and look at the unwarped kind of case space, you see that um, the grappa kernel is being applied to a different kind of area in case space, where it's warped one direction and warped the other direction for the even and the odd lines of application. So the way to fix this is essentially to have different kernels for the even and the odd lines to, um, to take care of the warp space as shown here. And with this we're able to fix most of the ghost artifact from the top slice landing on the middle slice. So this is the method that we came up with. And we get a pretty good result without much artifact in the image. So that was kind of the method parts for the simultaneous multi-slice. We have blip kyp and slice grappa algorithm to um, do our work. And let's look at some validation now. So here's um, 2 millimeter isotropic whole head 60 slice 
we're going to do um, SMS 3, so 3 slides simultaneously using a standard 32 channel head coil at 3T. And if we did this with the Y band method, we're going to get 3.5 voxel smearing artifact, which we don't get with the blip Kaipi technique. So here's the collapse image. We pull them out and get nice images here. We use a Monte Carlo simulation to um, look at how much retained SNR we have compared to acquiring one slice at a time. So here we see that there's no, essentially no G factor penalty. We actually get SNR retention of slightly above 100% in some location due to noise cancellation property of the grappa kernel. And if you look without the blip KIP acquisition, if all the three slices are collapsed on top of each other and you're trying to pull it out, you get a much lower retain than SNR. So you only retain about 50% while else you retain 100% here. So our blip KIP technique is really reduced the G factor penalty by two. What we're trying to show here is that you can acquire data three times as fast without a G factor penalty and retain the same SNR as a standard acquisition. So that's great news. So let's see if we can use the sequence. So we did it on a DTI acquisition, B of um, 1,000. This is the standard acquisition of 10 minutes. Um, now we reduce the TR by a factor of 3 to around 3.3 seconds. Since the T1 recovery of, um, since the T1 of white matter is pretty low at around 1 second, so we're still expecting to get close to fully relaxed signal at this TR of 3 seconds, so we should not lose significant amount of SNR. And here's the um, angle of uncertainty analysis on our um, data that we collect. The first fiber orientation and the second fiber orientation showing that um, the angle of uncertainty in um, these fibers where they exist are pretty much the same for the 1x acquisition and the 3x acquisition. So we're able to collect the same data three times as fast here. Also we did the same thing for cue ball acquisition where we did um, B of 3000 now instead of 1000. 12 minutes acquisition, 4 minute acquisition here. This is the B equal to zero image. You see that this some signal loss here due to the fact that our TR is shorter, but the signal loss is mainly in the CSF where we don't really care because um, we're not using it for diffusion and the T1 is much longer. Well, in the white matter, the, um, the signal loss should be very minimal in this case. And here's a B3000 image looking pretty much the same in these two. And then you have the um, general FA map for these um, results. Now we did um, five acquisition of both 1x and 3x acquisition to try to look at um, angle of uncertainty and stuff like that through bootstrapping methods. And we look at the first maxima and the second maxima of the ODF and look at the angle of uncertainty. They're pretty much the same in both cases. And if you zoom in into a particular area, we want to see the ODF itself. Here's the ODF of the one minute, um, the one x twelve minute acquisition and the three x four minute acquisition. They're essentially the same here. Also, we can try to um, do our acquisition three x SMS with standard in plane as well. So combining these, we get a six x kind of parallel imaging. So with this two x in plane, we're doing this because we want to reduce um, distortion. So again, we use the same parameter for cue ball acquisition with V3000. Now the TR is going to be a little shorter, but it's not going to be much shorter. It's going to be um, around 3.1, I think, instead of, I think it was four seconds before. And this shortening of TR is due to the fact that our um, EPI encoding is reduced by two. Uh, 3.6, there you go. So the image that we got from this 6x parallel imaging is this collapsed data. The way we um, try to process this data is first we apply slice grapper to tease out the three slices and then we apply in-plane grapper to basically uncollapse these slices. So note that there's only a few of you over four shift between the imaging slice, not a few of you over two. This is because we were doing in-plane acceleration. And if you shift by a few of you over two, basically you just wrap around and there's no, no, you will end up with no shift between the slices. So this kind of limits a little bit um, the amount of shift that we can apply. Therefore, we expect the G factor penalty to be a little bit higher, but not too bad. So 
Here's the SNR comparison between the standard Grappler 2 and Grappler 2 plus 3x simultaneous multi-slice for the three slice here. Retain SNR is good. It's not 100%, but it's still pretty high. And we're going to focus on the center slice here for our analysis, where the retain SNR is worse, around 75%. I want to stress that here we're acquiring data three times as fast, so we're gaining a square root of three, which will overcompensate for the SNR loss that we have in the center slice. So here's the cue ball acquisition comparing the 10 minutes to the three minute scan. B equal to zero, B equal to 3000. You can start seeing a little bit noise amplification here. And here's the GFA map. And if you do again the bootstrap comparison, you see that you get a little bit of a reduction in both the um, first and the second maximal angle of uncertainty. But this is for one acquisition, which is three times as fast as this one. So if you do two or three of these acquisitions and average them up, the angle of uncertainty is actually less than this. So we're still gaining a lot in terms of SNR per unit time. Now, if you zoom into a particular region, you can see the um, ODF. And you can see that they're pretty much you know, near identical. We can also apply our blip Kuiper acquisition to um, speed up the diffusion spectrum imaging, which is a great um, um, encoding method for diffusion, but it just takes so much time. So diffusion spectrum imaging takes about 41 minutes, which is not really clinically applicable. If you apply this SMS thing, you can reduce the acquisition time by a factor of three. So here's um, image acquisition for the standard and the three X accelerated acquisition showing things are very similar. So that's the first part of the talk. We talked about simultaneous multi-slice acquisition. Second part will be on the compressed sensing for DSI. Um, so first, when I want to get into this, I want to kind of give you a model of the um, diffusion spectrum imaging and see how we can undersample the data that is acquired for this DSI to speed things up. So in diffusion imaging, what we're doing is we're essentially acquiring data at different um, Q space position by turning on different gradients to sensitize our data for a particular diffusion direction. So if you acquire different Q space positions by turning on these different gradients, you're going to get different diffusion weighted image, each one representing a particular Q space point. So these are all the different Q space points, if you will. And um, if you look at one of the voxel here and plot the signal intensity as a function of Q, as shown here in the Q space sample, so for one voxel you're acquiring all the different Q space points. You have a grid, so this is a 3D grid laid out in a two-dimensional case where this is the direction along Z. So you sample on this kind of sphere of um, Q space points. And then you just do a simple discrete Fourier transform and you get a probability density function of the diffusion at that particular voxel. So this is essentially the diffusion spectrum imaging. You acquire a lot of data and then just simply do a discrete Fourier transform and you get this um, PDF of the diffusion for that voxel. So how are we going to try to speed this up? The way that we want to speed it up is using compressed sensing, where we're going to undersample the Q space, let's say by a factor of three here, and use our sparse prior information about the PDF, where we can say that the PDF of the diffusion is smooth, or something like that, to try to um, reconstruct the whole PDF that we want. So this is the standard method that someone's um, Mensel has proposed in 2011. Well, what we're doing here is we're trying to reconstruct the PDF P using these three terms um, in the regularization. The first term is the data consistency, consistency term. So Q is basically the Q samples that we have collected. P is the PDF that we want to reconstruct. F is an undersample DFT that takes us from the fully sampled PDF to the undersample Q space sample that we've collected. So that's the data consistency term. We want to create a PDF that basically that has the right um, Q space sample that we've collected. And then we're going to try to include in the optimization some regularization term that accounts for um, 
um, the prior information that we have about the PDF. So in this case, we're just including a wavelet term and a total variation term. So we want to note here that the CS compressed sensing reconstruction is done at a voxel level. So we're doing one voxel at a time in this case. So the question, the natural question to ask is that when we're doing this, is our prior information correct? Is the PDF really sparse in the wavelet and the total variation domains? And we're not sure. So one way of trying to improve this is to try to um, come up with a basis set where the um, PDF is sure to be sparse. And we can do this using a dictionary-based um, method where we're going to come up with a dictionary using some um, training PDF so that this dictionary of basis set is going to, can represent the PDF using only a few coefficients. I want to say that um, the main contributor in this work is Birkin. He's been um, working with me on this, and he's been um, doing a lot of the heavy lifting on this. So here's um, what we do. The first step is to create the training data. Um, sorry, to create the dictionary. So you might want to sample, basically do a fully sample DSI acquisition to get the PDF from one subject. And this P matrix here represents um, all the different PDF at different voxel that you have from that subject. Each PDF is a column in this matrix. And what we want to do is come up with a basis set D here, which can represent well all the different PDF with um, the coefficient being in this X matrix. So we want it to represent the PDF well with a small error, as well as we want it to represent the PDF in a sparse manner where a lot of the terms in this X matrix will be zero. So we can actually create this um, dictionary using a, a known algorithm, KSVD, um, by, Ar I'm not very good at pronouncing his name, Aharon. Yeah. Um, and if we do that, then we're able to get the dictionary that we want. And then once we have that dictionary, we can just apply a um, L1 constraint optimization to this, where instead of having the PDF here, we're going to have D, which is the dictionary multiplied by X coefficient. This represents the PDF, but X is now sparse, we're sure, because of this dictionary training. So if we do this, and in this case, we just use a focus algorithm to do this, then we're sure that um, we're going to get a good reconstruction. So let's compare the standard um, total wavelet, uh, um, total variation and wavelet sparse um, reconstruction with this focus KSVD based um, methods. Can? Yep. So the dictionary is constructed from one subject, and then you're assuming it generalizes to other subjects? So that yep. And um, I'll show you that it kind of does. <laughs> So here's some result. So we actually acquire a fully sample 515 direction DSI on the connectome scanner, 2.3 millimeter isotropic, Bmax of 8,000. We're going to simulate a 3x under sampling using compressed sensing. So we're going to sparsely sample, as shown here. And then here's the result for different methods. I didn't quite go into the L1 focus, but um, here's the wavelet method. Wavelet plus total variation, and here's the result from the dictionary focus method, and here's the fully sampled data. And this result is to reconstruct basically the missing direction um, at a high B value here and a, a bit lower um, Q value here. Um, 515 direction essentially is a 11 by 11 by 11 kind of um, size of grid. And this is at the edge of the grid, so it's at the highest Q value as a function of Q going here. And the 0, 4, 0 here represents somewhere a bit closer to the center. And this is the root mean square error plot of the um, error of the reconstructed um, missing directions using these three different methods. And as you can see, at kind of closer to the center of Q space, the reconstruction is okay for all of them, but as you get kind of further out, these um, reconstruction fails because the wavelet and total variation just tends to kind of um, appetize out the Q space point and 
uh, outer Q space point, and it doesn't work really well, similar with the L focus. And I just want to show that this is just not a scaling problem, because if you kind of brighten this up by changing the scaling factor, you can see that it's really noisy and a lot of artifact, and the total um, wavelet and total variations just doesn't work at all. Um, while in the dictionary focus method, we seem to be able to reconstruct pretty well to the actual sample data set. Now here's the overall average root mean square error for all the different um, direct missing directions. So here's the wavelet plus total variation, here's the L1 focus, here's the dictionary. As um, Bruce was asking about the training data being applied to other subjects, so here's the um, here's the data being applied to subject A, where we're going to train try to train using subject A or subject B or subject C. Um, and you can see that the root mean square error is pretty much the same for the three cases, showing that the dictionary kind of generalized. And also we can try to push the acceleration factor a bit more. So even with i equal to 5, you still get pretty good um, root mean square error, and i equal to 9, the acceleration factor is really high here, but the root mean square error is still a lot less than these other methods that has been previously proposed. And one thing that um, we want to get to is actually this root mean square error might not be quite correct because we're subtracting the, um, the reconstruction that we did on the um, compressed sensing with a fully sampled data. But the fully sampled data at high Q space point is going to be noisy. So it's not going to quite represent the two through image. So we want to get a bit closer to a noise free root mean square error metric um, on our compressed sensing data. So we actually acquired 10 averages of the fully sampled data in those missing directions and try to subtract it from our um, compressed sensing reconstruction. And what we found was a bit surprising, actually. So let's look first at the, um, this is the dictionary reconstructed image. Subtract from the um, 10 average data that we collect, the average of the 10 data sets that we collect for that direction. And you see the error is pretty low for all the five directions that um, we are able to collect this in. And kind of goes up a little bit at high Q value, but not much. But if we actually do the same root mean square error analysis on our actual acquired data, where we just basically took one of the 10 averages and then subtracted from the mean um, image, you can see that the error is actually slightly higher than our reconstruction of the compressed sensing data as shown here, in particular in this high Q value. So we're actually able to better reconstruct this image in some extent than actually acquiring it using the compressed sensing. And the reason for this is that um, we're imposing some sparse constrained prior information to our data, and we're also pulling information from all the other Q space points to try to reconstruct this data. So there's some kind of SNR um, noise averaging effect, if you will, because we're using all the different Q space points to reconstruct this. So it shows that um, we're doing pretty well with the, um, the dictionary focus-based method, and the other two methods just doesn't work that well. So now that I've talked about the simultaneous multi-slice acquisition and the compressed sensing, we're going to combine these two and then um, acquire data very rapidly on the connectome system with the 64 channel, right? So for this, what we want to achieve is um, a very quick DSI scan. This is 2.5 millimeter isotropic whole brain. DSI would be max of 8,000, and we're able to acquire this in four minutes. The technology that we use to improve the efficiency of the um, diffusion spectrum imaging acquisition are uh, as follow. So first, we use a high strength connectome gradient hardware this reduced the TE from 112 milliseconds to 72 milliseconds. If we assume a T2 of around 70 or 80, the SNR gain from this is around 220%. Then we also use the simultaneous multi-slice acquisition with the blip KIPI and the 64 channel array that Boris built for us. And we can acquire data three times as fast. This represents a 48% SNR gain after accounting for um, loss in T1 um, reduction, I mean, the reduction in TR causing um, not fully recovered signal. We're still gaining about 
And then we're also going to apply Q-space compress sensing reconstruction to get another spec factor of four speed improvement. So the normal 515 direction DSI acquisition with SMS3 simultaneous multi-slice 3 takes about 16 minutes to acquire. And if we want to apply the same SNR match scan on a standard 3T with a normal sequence, it will take about 2 hours and 40 minutes. <coughs> and now we're going to speed that up further by a factor of 4 using compressed sensing. So now we got to 4 minutes compared to basically close to 3 hours. So here's um, the result of the SMS3 compressed sensing 4. Just want to do a quick um, analysis. First, comparing it to the standard SMS case that we applied three slides simultaneously. What we did here was um, Anastasia was helpful enough to try to help us um, get some of the tracks. We don't want to show the whole tracks of the whole brain because it's hard to um, assess, but what we did was we isolate the track going through 18 white matter pathways where these, um, these tracks are defined by regions of interest that it has to pass through in these different pathways. So there's 18 of them and what we see is that the tracks we saw are similar for both cases and a bit surprising is that, um, I'm not sure if this image came out well, but um, SMS3 compressed sensing 4 actually does a little bit better than just SMS3 by itself in some areas such as this um, corpus callosum fossa area of this back part here where we have more tracks here. And this is likely due to the increased SNR of our constrained um, reconstruction. And if we look at the FA, on all these um, different 18 tracks and plot it for the 1x and the 3 um, for the 3x by itself and 3x SMS and compress sensing 4 we see that the FA is pretty much the same in all area we did a one way and over test on the difference in the mean FA of each of the tracks and then we see that they're pretty much um, there's no significant difference here's just some more pictures of the um, acquisition, you can see that with this DSI, you can clearly differentiate the um, crossing fibers, and you get nice images. So, in summary, we've proposed um, SMS blip KIP and dictionary-based compressed sensing, and we validated as techniques to significantly improve efficiency of diffusion imaging. This by a factor of 12 here, and we're using this to acquire four-minute DSI acquisition. Um, take it and also take advantage of the good SNL provided by the Connectome and the 64 channel headquarter array. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators and um, thank you for your attention.